afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining for this a virtual media briefing. We will be addressed by the Minister of Home Affairs, Information and Public Affairs, the Honorable Wilfred Abrams, who will give an update on the national cleanup campaign. Minister of Health and Wellness, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey, the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick on the current COVID-19 situation. The Director of the University of the West Indies Seismic Research Center, Dr. Irosola Joseph, who will provide details on the latest activity at the La Soufre Volcano and the Senior Veterinary Officer, Dr. Mark Trotman. We will go first to Minister Abrams. Hey, sorry, I was just trying to unmute. Um, good afternoon, Barbados. I, as, as we promised, we're here again to update you and just keep you informed as to what is going on with the follow up from the eruption in St. Vincent of the La Soufrière volcano. And we're trying to cover all of our bases. We've gotten a number of questions and we keep getting questions um, from Barbadians. And we try our best to answer those in these briefings as much as we can. So, for example, we keep getting questions from people as to what to do with the pets and their, their livestock is grazing and they're having problems with that. So that's what that's how we decide who we invite in and to try to give you as comprehensive an update as we possibly can to address all of your questions in one and to keep you as informed as we are. So I'll start now with the update on the cleaning campaign. We've undertaken perhaps the most massive cleaning campaign, emergency cleaning campaign in the history of Barbados. I don't think there has ever been a cleanup campaign as intense as this involving as many sectors as this. A case in point, we're trying to get the major installations of government open so we can get ourselves back to some degree of regularity the dust has not affected us in the same way as it had on the initial eruption. And we've had a lessening of the ash fallout over the country. Um, we're trying our best to get the country clean and safe so people can return to work and some degree of normalcy because as people keep pointing out, we were on lockdown for a while. And as we came out of lockdown, this happened and we effectively went into another lockdown again so we're cleaning government is cleaning all its major installations just as the private sector and um, commerce in barbados are cleaning those so that we can get the country back up and going one of the most critical installations that we are trying to get back on track is the airport um, and that's for a number of reasons persons have been commenting that we're trying to get the airport open to receive tourists it's, it's not as simple as that Having our airports and seaports closed effectively cuts Barbados off from the rest of the world. We cannot receive any supplies of any kind. We can't get vaccines in. We can't get tests in. We can't get basic supplies in with the airport and the seaport closed. Um, Colonel Bostick may tell you this, but even our customary sending of our samples to CARFA in order to test the samples outside of Barbados for certain variants We've been unable to do because the RSS plane has been grounded with the closure of the airport and the closure of our airspace. So it is not as simple as people think initially, and it's critical for us as a country to have our airspace open. If there's a major emergency and somebody had to be airlifted out, we can't get them out with the airport closed. So having the airport reopen is one of the priority targets for the government and to get that done in the shortest possible time. Minister Cummings will join you a little bit later to advise as to what is going on with the airport as she is in a briefing meeting at the moment, um, checking off the boxes to make sure that all that was supposed to be done has been done because an airport is not a highway. We can take a risk and drive on a highway, but our airport has to meet certain standards. The runway has to meet certain standards in order for planes to take off and land on it. So. That is going on now, and we hope before the end of this press conference that Minister Cummings will be able to update us with what all Bages want to know um, as in the timing of the opening of the airport. I just want to address something. It's, it's almost frustrating sometimes as we are doing everything that we can, and Barbados is trying its best to get back on track, and we have to deal with the social media jollies. Um, there has been 
some videos circulating on social media showing a number of trucks on the airport runway and people suggesting that instead of cleaning up persons were drag racing on the runway and wasting time and wasting money nothing can be further from the truth yesterday the prime minister invited all of the major contractors up to the airport on site and we had a meeting on site on the runway so everyone could see firsthand exactly what it is that we're dealing with and understand the priority that we needed to apply to the airport and to get any runway and the airport back open the prime minister addressed the major contractors in barbados and indicated that this is a, a unified effort that they should go away and come up with an agreed plan as to how to deal with the cleaning of the runway in the shortest possible time a lot of ideas were put forward hosing down the the runway um sweeping the runway everything but at some parts of the runway those of you who have ash in your yard or if you look on the sidewalk or the road you will see that the ash where it's hardened is hardened almost in waves and those waves are like cement so that even washing it or power washing it causes some difficulty but as you can see when people drive on the road if people are driving at a fast speed then that breaks up and spits up into the air as dust so all of the contending options were considered and the dominant option was that we should bring as many trucks as possible onto the runway and drive on the runway at speed to try to break up those hard areas of compacted dust so that they could then be moved otherwise so what you saw yesterday was exactly that strategy being put into place so i mean bajans are bajans and some people decide to have fun with it and you know there's always this competition between the contractors or anybody in the same discipline so they had some fun with it but this was not a jolly or they were not off on a frolic of their own they were executing the coordinated and decided plan as to how to clear the runway um the contractors were on site all of last night and into this morning and all day so since the press conference yesterday you had plenty plenty people um equipment all the resources that were available were deployed to the airport to get the airport open and that is continuing and that is the meeting that minister cummings is at now to see exactly where we are with that the other issue that arose um persons were complaining that we were using water when people in barbados had no water and a number of people called me with very helpful suggestions and i wish to assure you that these suggestions were taken but quite frankly from a couple of days ago we were using seawater to wash as many things as we could um bridgetown was clean entirely with water pulled from the wharf as was swan street a large section of the airport was cleaned with seawater as well um we could not clean the runway itself with salt water because embedded in the runway are certain lights and electrics that could not take the salt water so the runway had to we had to use a different plan for the runway after we broke up the hard dust with the trucks and the bulk of what was used at the airport on the runway was actually recycled water from the Bridgetown sewage plant and also the Coverley sewage plant that water was chlorinated and treated to make it safe and that was then used so minimal minimal water from the Barbados Water Authority's distribution um, network was used in cleaning up the airport and minimal water from the BWA is actually being used on the roads so we are employing all of the resources in a sensible and sustainable way and i want to assure barbadians that the government is putting a lot of thought into what is is being done and we are consulting widely and we're trying to come up with the best plan please forward your suggestions because many of the suggestions you came up with um were actually suggestions that we had considered and we're using but it shows that persons are on the same page and quite frankly please forward your suggestions because you may think of something that we have not thought of and we are happy to consider it because the there's no pride in this right now this is a learning curve for all of us and the aim is to just get barbados as clean as possible as quickly as possible to that extent notwithstanding covid 19 directive number eight the attorney general has granted exemption for all businesses all enterprises and all persons to perform cleanup activities on sunday april the 18th 2021 whether residential or otherwise so we know that sunday is usually the shutdown day under our COVID directives 
this Sunday, you are allowed um, to be out in full force to do your cleanup activities. On Monday, there will be a damage assessment. So the ash fall has also triggered a post event damage assessment and needs analysis. Uh, this is being led by the Ministry of Economic Affairs along with the Ministry of Home Affairs. This will provide both a qualitative and financial costing of the impact of the hazard, identify in detail our resource needs and allow us to be very specific in our request for assistance to deal with our post event recovery. This is an intensive rapid assessment um, for which we have already started gathering critical information. It covers agriculture, infrastructure, technology, utilities, and every sector that we expect to have been affected by the ash fall. The task force draws on both public and private sector experts, and we want to thank our private partners who have agreed to assist us, as well as the UN system, who are also providing technical expertise so the team can hit the ground running on Monday. Um, an update with respect to the status at the port. The port continues to service vessels, discharging or offloading cargo as required. Delivery of containers was paused today to facilitate the service of air conditioning systems on cargo handling equipment and to clean up the roadways and cargo stacking areas. As of today, um, Shed 4 has been prepared to restart operations fully on Monday, 19th April, 2021. Shed 2, that is the shed where personal effects are delivered, is currently being cleaned and ready also for operation on Monday. To minimize complaints, the Barbados Port Authority Inc. has been using private contractors to do sweeping and wetting and shoveling after these people pass through the roads. And the AC units across the port will be serviced during the weekend ahead of opening workspaces. The work in the Port Administration Office continued without interruption. Um, with respect to the fish markets, all of the major cleanup and washing down in the markets will be completed by this evening. The vendors have been working closely with the staff, and I wish to commend the fisher folk who have banded together in this exercise to do what is in their best interest. Government can't do it all, and the vendors have been working closely with the staff, and we want to thank them for that cooperation. The cleanup work will continue tomorrow with a view towards opening on Monday as well. The challenge at Concept Bay and the Millie Eiffel, that's the Western um, fish markets, is that the ash is blowing downhill from the road into the market. And the ministry is working with the MTW to wash down the area. The Payne's Bay market will be closed until further notice due to the need to clean up, which is complicated by the ongoing roadworks along Highway 1. I wouldn't normally do this, um, but I was asked by a community group, and I want to do it for a reason. The government cannot do it all on its own. Residents have to help not just the government, but also help themselves. The longer the ash we take to clean the ash up off the roads and off of, out of our yards is the longer we have to suffer with what we've been going through for the last week. So I'm asking Barbadians to take the opportunity over the weekend while the government is also cleaning all of its installations over the weekend to clean up your homes and your areas because once we get the ash removed then it stops blowing and affecting both you and somebody else. To this end, the residents of West Terrace are having a community cleanup tomorrow, Saturday, April the 17th to remove the ash from the roads. This gives the homeowners the opportunity to clean around their premises and to bring it to the road. Teams will come through and shovel up the streets with a bobcat to dispose of the ash. Residents are asked to start from 7 a.m. Um, there'll be a small fee of $5 to assist in paying for the, the equipment to move the ash from the neighborhood. So, and those requiring assistance to clean around their house can arrange with members of the team to clean it as well. Each street will be alerted when the team is coming down their avenue and the residents are inviting everyone to come out and join the cleanup. And they say, they emphasize that we're working as a community to help ourselves and our nations. As I said, I would not normally um, deal with something like this in a press briefing, but let us use West Terrace as the example and communities, if you band together, we can get it done a lot more quickly and a lot more effectively. While we are suffering through this, I just ask us please to have, bear in mind our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent, let us not keep them far from our prayers. We are trying to get back to some degree of normalcy, but it will be a lot longer for them and the consequences for them are a lot more dire. So I ask you please to bear them up in your prayers as we try to get our lives back together understand it would take a lot longer for them to do the same. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Minister Abrams. We go now to Minister Bostic. 
Thank you very much, Alisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I get to my COVID report, I am happy to say to you that all of our polyclinics and medical facilities were open for business today, thanks to the cleanup that was done yesterday. And most places were able to open on time. We had a few hiccups, dust related, but the staff persevered and I would like to really salute all categories of staff at our institutions for coming out to work and for trying desperately to ensure the continuation of the delivery of medical services in this country. So I salute you today. The place that was most affected today, however, was the Lady Mead reference unit which is due for an industrial clean tomorrow. And as a result of that, we were only able to offer emergency services today. And on behalf of the Ministry of Health and Wellness and my own behalf, I apologize to all of those clients who would not have been able to obtain normal services today at the LRU. Now to COVID, overnight at the Best Dos Santos Laboratory, 576 tests were done, yielding 12 new positives, four males and eight females, so that the positivity rate today was less than 3%. Eight persons will be released from isolation today. Of note is the fact that the S3 of the 12 new positives were already persons at Harrison Point sent there for assessment previously. So we had nine fresh ones, as we would say today. Regrettably, all nine of those cases or positives are related directly and indirectly to the church cluster, the church cluster from the north. Directly, because there are two families from the north comprising four and three members each that were directly connected to this church that tested positive. And then there was a family of two indirectly connected because they were connected directly to one of the other institutions that had been impacted by this church cluster. And although these figures and, or these stats are low, my concern and the concern of the ministry is the fact that they're all related to this church cluster. And this is a cluster. This right now is occupying the attention more than anything else of the Ministry of Health and Wellness in our fight against the COVID pandemic. And I would like to really make an appeal to all Barbadians, since this really has always been and always intended to be an all of society approach. And I make the appeal because we've always stated that the ministry, in spite of all of its efforts, in spite of the technical expertise which we have, in spite of the experience which we've been able now to gather, we cannot do it alone. We depend on every single citizen and resident of this country to work with us to be able to contain the spread of COVID in Barbados. So I appeal to all Barbadians in general, but particularly to all persons associated with the church in the north, that cluster. If you have not yet been contacted by Ministry of Health officials, it is because one, we have not been told about your exposure. And two, in cases where we have been told, we've not been able to find you because I would have to say that you are hiding. Now, this is a serious thing. And it's a serious thing because we cannot afford to slip up. We cannot afford to slip up. And even if you do not care about your own health and wellness and your well-being, I care. The Ministry of Health Cares, the government of Barbados, we care. And so we want to find you because if you remain in hiding, if you remain knowing that you have symptoms and you present, too late, it could be detrimental to your health. 
So I appeal to you to come forward, present at the Wilde Gymnasium testing site and be tested for your family's sake, for your sake, for your community's sake, and for the country's sake. The country and the residents and citizens of this country is that's far bigger than any single institution or organization. Let us do as the Bible say and be our brothers and sisters keeper. And I urge you to present to one of the healthcare facilities. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Bostic. Now, many people have had questions relating to their livestock or pets being affected by the ash. And Senior Veterinary Officer, Dr. Mark Trotman, will try to shed some light on the situation. <clears throat> Dr. Trotman? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, first, let me say that the Ministry of Agriculture has been working very hard with the farmers um, and the agricultural societies to try and see how best we can work together to address the challenges that we're now faced with. Um, and there, there are quite a few challenges. Um, as I've said in previous breath, um, press briefings or press um, sessions, the ash is potentially toxic. Not only toxic, but it can cause other problems as well too. Um, the ash um, is causing, and we are seeing examples of this happening um, as reported by veterinary surgeons across the island already. Um, what we're seeing happening is that um, a lot of animals, some, several animals are coming down with respiratory problems, coughing, sneezing, um, ocular and nasal discharges. Um, you know, the, these are the acute signs of in, inhalation of the ash. And this is already manifesting itself um, across the island. And so that is something that pet owners, I'll talk about pet owners, first of all, need to be very cognizant of that. Try to keep your pets either indoors or in some sort of sheltered structure, um, especially during ashfall periods. Um, we have a bit of a respite right now, but um, that's no guarantee it won't continue. Um, the other problem that pets are, fa are going to be facing <clears throat> is contaminated um, feed bowls, contaminated water bowls, uh, picking up toys that have been, have been, um, that have been um, contaminated by the ash and ingesting the ash. That in itself then causes secondary problems, chronic problems such as digestive problems, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea. These are things that may not necessarily manifest themselves instantly, but you will start to see those happening a week later or, 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 or so going forward. So, you know, the, the best advice that I can give pet owners is to keep the animals away from any ash plumes or ash fall. Um, be very attentive to what they put in their mouths. Be very attentive. There's a report of a of, of, of dog having uh, from one veterinarian of eating, eating, actually eating ash. Um, the ash, when it gets wet, becomes like a piece of cement in the stomach. So blockages are going to be fairly, uh, fairly apparent fairly soon. So that's it with the pets. Protect the pets, protect their feed supply, protect their, wa their water supplies, keep them out of the ash fall and the ash plumes. Um, grazing animals are the most susceptible to problems with, um, with ash fall, and, um, both the falling ash and the ash on the pastures, um, especially sheep. Sheep are what we call close grazers. They, they, eat, they graze the grass very close to the ground and they commonly take up soil when they're eating. So ash, even if the ash is not on the blades of grass, they're on the soil and the sheep will pick up the ash from the soil when they're grazing. And so these, and we already have reports of sheep getting sick as we speak from, most of these are respiratory right now, but we will probably start to see more chronic problems with digestive problems with the sheep. Um, as, as, um, as time goes on. Um, there are still sheep out there, there's still cattle out there in the, in, the, in the pastures. I understand that some farmers may not necessarily have a choice, but wherever possible, sheep really should be taken out of pastures in sheltered areas, or at least paid very close attention to. Um, if the animals' faces are covered in, in ash, they should be washed to protect, them, protect their eyes and their ears and their noses from contamination. This is very, very important. Um, you, the, the, there, there are even further long-term effects we're going to be getting from the sheep and cattle as well too, because the, the ash is so abrasive and they're, and they're taking in the, the cash. And this is reports I've been getting from veterinarians, 
from countries that had experienced volcanic ash um, problems. And that is that the teeth of the, of, the, of the ruminants start to wear down. And they actually start to grind right down and break because of the, of the abrasive nature of the ash. And they then become inappetent. They, they, they can't eat, they, they lose their appetites and they, they die of starvation. So they're, they're, there are all kinds of long-term, me, acute, medium-term and long-term challenges that this ash fall presents. And farmers really need to be aware of this and while you might think you have gotten away with it because the animal doesn't die instantly, there are, there are further problems going on the road that will probably manifest itself later on. Try to avoid allowing your animals to graze on contaminated pastures. That's the best advice I can give you. Make sure that the feed is protected when they're eating. Make sure the water is protected when they're eating. We are trying to find sources of fresh, clean fodder um, to make available. We, we are looking to, um, I know that the Barbados Agricultural Society is working assiduously among its members to see what is in stock, what is in storage, um, to see some way to be able to share so that those who don't have may be able to get some. We're looking at trying to import um, some sort of fodder substitute to feed the animals. This is all actively what we're working on now. We're doing analytical tests on the ash to find out how toxic it is with fluorine or arsenic or other, other sulfur, or other chemicals that might be in the ash. Um, the government analytical services is doing a number of tests to try and see what the, what the composition of the ash is. And that's gonna be very important to allow us to anticipate what kind of problems we exist. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that we are trying to get, a, get information on how many livestock we have on the island. We don't have a good solid record of the, the population. And I would really encourage um, farmers, backyard farmers, um, hobbyist farmers who may not necessarily be formal members of an agricultural society to contact the Barbados Agricultural Society and make themselves known because we can only help you if we know that you exist. We can only cater for you and know how much, how much fodder we need to bring in and how much who we need to distribute to if we, if we know who you are. So I would really encourage you to contact the Barbados Agriculture Society, make sure that you are amongst those who, uh, well, we know how many animals you have, so we can calculate how much we need to get to be able to supply the, 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 um, the, 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 the population, the, the livestock population. There are a few things that you can do if the pastures are not too heavily contaminated. And those would be primarily the, uh, the pastures in the south of the island. Um, and it's, uh, it's no guarantee and it will not be a, a, a perfect cure but you can employ, apply sprinklers or blowers to try and, and um, wash the grasses. This would be more, more relevant or more practical for cattle who are higher grazers and they will just eat the leaves of the grass rather than go right down to, the, um, to where the ash is on the ground. But um, blowers to blow the ash off the grass, uh, sprinklers or washers to wash the ash off the, 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 the blades of grass may help, may help. Um, cattle are a little more tolerant to ash than, than sheep are. Um, and then the other thing too is that you need to keep your animals under constant veterinary surveillance. Make sure you have con to make contact with a veterinary surgeon um, and let them keep an eye on your animals so they can pick up any problems that might be, be developing. We do have a number of veterinarians who cater to, to livestock and um, we have that list at veterinary services. If you, if you don't have your own veterinarian, give us a call at the veterinary services and we will put you in contact with the veterinarian who will be able to, will be able to help you out. So that's it for me in terms of what um, you, you need to look out for and what you can do to help yourselves with respect to the ash fall. Thank you. Thank you very much for that information, Dr. Trotman. Now, Director of the UWI Seismic Research Center, Dr. Irosula Joseph, will now provide the very latest on activity at the last Sufre volcano. Dr. Joseph? Hi, good day, everyone. Thank you for having me. So with respect to an update, this is as of the mo morning, six o'clock advisory that was uh, sent out to our various stakeholders, including the Prime Minister of Barbados. So, Seismic activity at the La Sufre volcano continued as before with near constant swarms of long period earthquakes. Now, um, you'd recall that long period earthquakes are the ones that indicate the movement of fluids, and fluids, by fluids I mean magma and gas, through the 
volcanic system. So, so that indicates that magma is able to move around um, and it's doing so. There was one band of low level tremor at nine o'clock last night. And this lasted about 40 minutes. Tremor is, is, a, is a type of a seismic signal that, that is associated with venting at the surface of the volcano. So this venting um, is not, doesn't necessarily um, mean that there's ash. It, um, sometimes it's a little bit of ash, but mostly it's, it's the gas that's being vented. So, so it's a combination of gas and ash, but it's not like an eruption where there's, you know, the ash column going up. So venting um, was seen at around nine o'clock last night, and this lasted about nine o'clock. And, um, and uh, what was uh, two things to note, one was that yesterday, we had our very first successful measurement of sulfur dioxide uh, flux. Now, flux is a mass concentration of uh, sulfur dioxide in the plume um, that's being generated from the volcano. And this was done by um, a, set, a survey on, on the sea using an instrument called a spectrometer. And this was done by Dr. Thomas Christopher, who's based at the Belmont Observatory. Um, uh, so, so this means, what does this mean? So sulfur dioxide is primarily a, the, the, the sulfur species associated with fresh magma degassing, right? So it's the, self, the, pref, the preferred, not the preferred, but the dominant sulfur species that, um, that's degassed with fresh magma. Um, this is opposed to hydrogen sulfide, that's the H2S, um, that's usually associated with hydrothermal systems. So hot springs and fumaroles that you normally see, such as in sulfur springs in St. Lucia. Right, so so it, this this um, us being able to detect and, and measure this SO two flux in a plume means that we've we are now able to have a ground based timeline of the SO two flux, and this is just um, an additional tool in our little arsenal um, to monitor the changes in activity at the volcano. So it, it means that um, primarily we were using the seismicity, which was the the bulk of it. We were also using ground deformation and um, we were seeing very little of that based on the network uh, that we have on Ireland. However, that has also changed. And we were also using remote techniques such as satellite imagery and so on. Um, and now we have this new tool um, that, that's showing results, which is the, the SO2 um, flux measurements. The, the thing with the ground deformation is we, we, have all, we are also now seeing a pattern um, of deflation from the seismic, sorry, from the ground deformation stations that are surrounding the volcano. Um, there are three, three stations that we've been able to get the data from uh, continuously that is tracking the deflation. And, and that deflation means that, um, think of a balloon. So when um, magma comes up and it fills this balloon, it, it expands. And uh, when the balloon is burst and that magma um, such magma gas um, is, is comes out of the surface we have that deflation so think of the volcano as that balloon and inflation means magma is filling it deflation means magma is coming out so we're looking for that change in going from the magma filling up which means fresh magma is coming up so prepare yourself for a series of eruption uh, you know the possibility of this going to you know, a longer term um, eruption. Um, but right now we're seeing the deflation signal, which means that everything that's in there is trying to get out. Um, what is, well, I, I know that, um, so in terms of the, the prognosis, uh, we are seeing that the, vol the volcano continues to erupt, although the explosive activity is somewhat um, diminishing in intensity, but that does not mean that it's ended at this time. So we, you know, in its current pattern of seismicity may indi indicate that there's periodic growth of a lava dome, but th this has not been confirmed. So we hope to see um, satellite images, uh, you know, to help us um, see, you know, how big a dome is growing, um, if there is a dome. But what can also happen is that this dome is continuously destroyed, you know, by, by any um, explosion, such as the one that happened this morning. Um, and then it has to rebuild itself, and then it acts like a little plug, and it keeps doing it. But the good thing is that in the last few days, we've not seen 
the the kind of energetic explosions that this volcano can produce it hasn't happened um which means there was less gas in the system to propel that material high up into the atmosphere to be able to be able to take it across by winds to Barbados and neighboring islands. So I hope this, you know, that makes things a bit clearer for everyone. It certainly does. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. And we're joined now by the Minister of Tourism and International Transport, Senator the Honorable Lisa Cummins, who will speak to the reopening of the Grantley Adams International Airport. Senator Cummins. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here with all of you and to hear the updates coming in from the UWA Seismic Research Center and all of the colleagues here at the Grant Adams International Airport. I wish to start first by saying that this was a complex and an extensive operation that spanned the entire area of the airport, all of our physical land space, our airfields, the land side, all of our internal facilities, as well as our IT capabilities, our satellites, the air traffic control capability, as well as our off-site locations, which are responsible for guiding planes safely into and around our airspace. And so it was, uh, it was an intense operation and I wish, first of all, to begin by expressing the appreciation of the government and certainly Prime Minister Motley in particular has asked that we express her heartfelt, her heartfelt uh, appreciation for every one of the major construction companies in Barbados that showed up here over the last few days to support this cleanup operation on this facility. Uh, every company was here, they worked every day throughout the night into the early mornings to be able to get us to a place where today at 6 a.m. we began the process of inspecting the airfield and all of our communications equipment. That process continued throughout the day. Uh, we are now in the process of finalizing the arrangements, but I wish to announce that the Grant the Adams International Airport will reopen at 6 p.m. this evening. Just for clarity, we will begin to allow commercial flights beginning at 6 p.m. this evening. The airspace has been given the all clear, the upper airspace and the lower airspace. We are still dealing based on the reports of the Met Office with some Sahara dust and some, some haze, but the volcanic ash that was compromising visibility in our airspace has since been removed. The expectation is that there will be some commercial activity commencing tomorrow. The airlines have been communicated with about the reopening of the airport from 6 p.m. this evening, and they will be making arrangements to get there into direct contact with their passengers. So we wish once more to express our appreciation to all of the contractors. We want to also incorporate the National Conservation Commission, the NCC, and their team, the Grant the Adams International Airport, and all of its team members, Goddard's Catering Group, all of the partners who are based here at the Grant the Adams International Airport and across the network of the Border Patrol agencies. We wish to thank you for supporting us in getting this far, this far at this stage. Uh, what this means for Barbados is that commercial flights will begin, humanitarian flights servicing St. Vincent and the Grenadines very importantly, will also be in a position to use Barbados as a landing base to service the needs of those people, our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who will benefit significantly from having our airport reopened. So thank you all very much, and we will continue to provide updates as the, time, the days evolve. I, I think perhaps one thing I should say before I, I go is that the airport's management is now going to be working along with all of the agencies I mentioned, of course, including the Ministry of Agriculture, Harvest Water Authority and others, to ensure that going forward over the coming weeks, there is a continuous maintenance plan because what has started here over the past few days is by no way, shape or form, fully completed. There's still much more to do. The dust continues to blow as the ash has settled all around the perimeter of the airport as well. And so it will be a continuous process to ensure that we keep not just the facility uh, ready and safe for flights, including the, engine, the engines of our flights, but most importantly, that the people who work in and around the Grand Adams International Airport are able to do so in a safe environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Cummins. As we go now to questions, we're joined by Marsha Gittins from the Barbados Advocate, Aliyah Briggs, CBC, Barry Allen, The Nation Newspaper, Randy Bennett, Barbados Today, and Wendy Burke from Starcom Network. 
your questions. Uh, good afternoon, Minister Bostic. I have two questions for you. This is Barry Allen from The Nation. Um, with regard to your concerns about members of the church who may possibly be hiding and not presenting for testing, can you give us a, an approximation of, of what, numbers, what numbers are you looking at that of persons that you're expecting to come forward or that you believe may be keeping themselves away from presenting for testing? Um, Barry, I cannot give you any number because we, we are satisfied that we do not have all of the information in relation to this matter. We are aggressively pursuing the matter and the more information that is made available then that gives us an idea as to what we are dealing with numerically, but we are, we are satisfied that we do not have all of the information, so it's difficult to make that determination at this stage. And my second question for you, Minister, is um, I remember you saying that the Chief Medical Officer of Barbados has particular power uh, within the framework of our directives. As part of, as part of his remit, is there a possibility that the leadership personnel of this church uh, could be brought in for questioning or for special questioning with regard to this cluster? We are very, very closely investigating and monitoring this situation. Um, any and everything that has to be done will be done. I can assure you that the leadership of the church, that leadership is in quarantine at a government quarantine facility. And as an investigations by the public health teams continues, then we will be in a better position to see exactly what we are dealing with, but nothing at this stage is rolled out. But our focus at the moment is really to try to get these people and all persons to come in to be tested because the aim is to contain the spread of the virus and to try to, um, to dig a hole, so to speak, in this cluster because we don't want this cluster to get out of hand and we've allocated resources to the cluster We've allocated a senior medical officer of health to be in charge of managing this entire process with all of the various institutions with daily reports being submitted so that we can keep on top of this one. And I give you the assurance that we will do so. Aliyah Briggs, CBC, Minister Bostic, um, could you provide an update on the national vaccination program? Are we still on track to commence administrating the second doses tomorrow? And would you be able to say how many persons have been vaccinated since we received the recent shipment from COVAX? I must confess that I have not really been following this aspect of things very, very closely because um, I was focused on dealing with the impact of the dust and the ash on the healthcare facilities and trying to get those facilities open so that we could continue offering the service that we have to offer. So between that, to be honest with you, and the, this cluster, which I've re has really been occupying my mind, this cluster as well, I, I, I cannot give you those figures. I'm not in a position to do so at this point in time, but I can get them for you. And what about the vaccination program? Are we set to commence uh, administrating the second doses tomorrow? I know that things are being put in place for that, but as I have said uh, on earlier press conferences, that although this obviously is connected to the Ministry of Health and Wellness, those plans are being coordinated by a special grouping, uh, that is Dr. Ferdinand and Major Clark, who are the ones who are mapping out that process. And I, I really could not give that information at this time. I have a question for Senator Cummins, Wendy Burke, Starcom Network. Can you give me some indication um, as to when we reopen at six, how many flights is it likely, how many flights are likely to arrive at the Grantley Adams International Airport, whether it be commercial flights or cargo, um, bringing much needed supplies for say St. Vincent or for Barbados itself? Uh, thank you for that question, Wendy. I think really the, the emphasis at this point very much is on that humanitarian support 
the regional security system continues obviously its base here in Barbados and by the airport and they we are hoping will be flying as early as tonight as well so we are going to be working closely with them I know that the airport team has been in constant contact with the regional security systems team and there will be some further update in, in due course but they will very much be the anchor of the humanitarian support. Now, in terms of commercial flights, uh, we have just issued earlier this evening the notice to the various airlines, and so they will be communicating with us about what their flight schedules are expected to be uh, over the coming days. We, are, we have the expectation that tomorrow we will have uh, around maybe five to six flights coming through potentially, because as you would have imagined, over the course of seven days or so with the airport having been closed, there are a number of people who are either here or who are abroad who have wanted to come home or to go back home. The numbers here are quite small, as you know, because we don't have that many tourist visitors on island, but we do have a number of Barbadians, for example, who have been here who need to get back out and vice versa in the reverse. We have a number of Barbadians who would have traveled abroad and have been eagerly awaiting the reopening of the Adams International Airport. And so I'm sure that they will be making contact with their airlines, giving an indication that they would wish to be made uh, put on the one of the first available flights heading into Grantley Adams, and then that would trigger the schedule being finalized for us. So we expect that within the first couple of days that we will be quite busy with both commercial flights and, of course, the ongoing humanitarian flights to service the needs of those brothers and sisters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay, can you just explain to me then how it was that BA Flight 255 on route from Heathrow this morning um, had to divert to Antigua? Um, was there some lapse in communication that they were thinking that we reopened this morning um, without first checking? How, how did that manage to come about? Well, the, as you would know, there's a, there's a significant time difference between uh, Barbados and the UK. The original no time that went out for the reopening of the airport was for 2 p.m. this afternoon, and BA normally would have arrived at 2.33. So they were expecting, hopefully, that the airport would have reopened at the time projected originally, but not confirmed. And so by 2 p.m., we were still not in a position at midday. I'm sorry, it was not 2 o'clock, it was at midday. At midday, we were still not in the position to complete the reopening of the airport. And if I could be a little bit more precise, some of the equipment that we were using to sweep the ash from the runway, we still had some dust residue as a result of drift coming down on the wind, uh, piling up on the runway that had to be further removed. And then some of the equipment that we were using to actually sweep the, 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 the sweeper trucks were actually leaving some of the metal bristles on the runway. And so that required a further intervention that we took this time this afternoon to extend the closure from midday through 6 p.m. to take that residual dust off, residual ash and dust off the runway, as well as to remove the bristles. And again, this was an occasion where our partners did not hesitate to support us. They sent additional equipment, specialist equipment, to ensure that we could clean the additional res residue and debris off the, the runway. So the flight that has been diverted to Antigua, we expect that there was, or actually there was an, an earlier flight at the beginning of the ash fall when the first eruption took place. And the expectation is that that flight will make its way from Antigua into Barbados now that we have announced the reopening of the airport. Thank, Thank you kindly. I can have one um, more question for um, Minister Cummings. Um, could, you could you tell us if we are still on track for the um, May 8th date for the new protocols as relates to the vaccinated users? Uh, thanks for that question, Randy. We actually spent the early part of this morning meeting with over 60 tour operators out of the markets and many of the major airlines going through the, uh, the protocols, getting a sense of what the market has been saying in response to the protocols, what the demand and projections are looking like for the rest of the season. And we continue to receive feedback and we expect that between now and the 8th of July, we will very much be in a position in collaboration with our partners, both here in Barbados in the industry and our tour operators and airline partners abroad in the markets, that we will very much be in a position to reopen Barbados for traffic for vaccinated passengers. And uh, sorry, to come in, just a quick follow up. All right, just one question. Just one question. Right. Go, ahead. Go ahead, Randy. Go ahead, Randy. Randy, I'll come, I'll come right back to you, Barry. 
You said 8th of July. Is it 8th of July? 8th of May. I'm sorry. 8th of of May. May 8th. I'm sorry. May 8th is the date of the protocols taking effect. Okay, thanks. I think it's Ash. The Ash. The Ash also getting to me. Go ahead, Barry. Your time. Thank thank you, Minister. Um, I was wondering if, based on the early conversation with those 82 operators, if you can give us an a pretty early prediction in terms of what they were telling you about demand for, for, for travel within the next seven to eight weeks. Are they seeing a high level of interest already or is it pretty, pretty uh, warm? There, for the summer season, the latter part from July onward, it's lukewarm, it's modest. And I think I may have said that in the last, the last time I addressed the country. Uh, from May, June or so, you'll probably see it a little bit lukewarm as you described, but that's not necessarily only about Barbados. As you would recall, if we start with the Canadian market, the Canadian market was closed to what they call sun destinations until the 30th of April. We've now seen that extending through June. And so the Canadian market, they continue to travel not through direct routes anymore on Air Canada or WestJet, but you may find persons traveling to the US and then coming on, which makes it a longer journey and potentially at sometimes perhaps even more expensive. So the Canadian market has its own challenges. If you're talking then about the UK market, the expectation is that they will be making an announcement on the 17th of May. And then there is the expectation that there will be very specific restrictions and new protocols introduced in the UK as well for persons returning to the UK after travel abroad. So there are a combination of factors, both in the source markets by based on their own domestic regulations uh, set in place by their governments and their regulators. And then of course, the protocols here in Barbados and how those two things will twin. So the period between May and June may be a little bit challenging because of those, uh, particularly we're talking about the Canadian and the UK market, but for the US market, as they continue with an aggressive vaccination program, as they continue to see reductions where we're appropriate, where we're seeing that happening in the number of cases, you will continue to see strong demand. But then this is very much that case where we've always been talking about a push into new markets and putting strong emphasis on non-traditional partners and of course on intra-regional travel as we build closer relationships right here in the region in our tourism industry. So the latter part of the year, quarter four, early part of 2022 is looking extremely strong. Demand is very strong, but there is that latent uncertainty remaining around the May, June period for the factors, for the reasons that I have just outlined, but then you see a moderate picking up in July, August through September. And a quick follow-up question, Minister. Are we any closer to yet developing a, an IT framework or electronic framework that would make it a little easier for vaccinated persons from uh, our markets to actually have a, a code reader or a code reading capability to show or prove the veracity of their vaccination when they do come in, let's say, June, July, August? So Barry, I think you were listening into our meetings earlier today, the cabinet COVID subcommittee (laughs) chaired by um, Senator Walker, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade and our colleague ministers took a presentation actually arranged by our ministry um, with from IATA. And so they are working with us along with Virgin Atlantic and we're hoping to be in a position to pilot with Virgin Atlantic the travel pass, which is built on pretty much the same principles that you just outlined, the verification of passenger identity, the provision of passenger test results that are in compliance with the national protocols that are required for entry into the country, the provision of certified Uh, vaccination results and we would define vaccinated travelers as those persons who have received both jabs of a two jab dose or one jab of a one jab dose and 14 days hence uh, before they travel. All of those things we are hoping to be able to incorporate in the IATA travel pass which uses their existing thematic system where we already upload our travel protocols and then provide shifts the burden of proof onto the check-in process prior to arrival in Barbados and then the verification system here in Barbados making the arrivals process even smoother. So uh, we should be in a position to announce once a final decision has been taken on when we can commence that. So you should really start listening in our meetings. (laughs) But thanks for the question. 
Sorry for listening in. <laughs> Melissa comments, um, in light of all that is going on, the Grantly Adams was looking toward move toward a public private sector partnership. And it had been put on hold when the whole COVID started. And you said the process would resume looking for new partners, given some who were there before may have lost interest. Can you now give us an update as to how that is going, if it is going, or if it's on hold temporarily? So Wendy, just, just a slight correction. Uh, there has been absolutely no loss of interest and there, there have been no partners who have backed out of the, the, the process for the PPP at the Grand Adams International Airport. In fact, it has been quite the opposite. I can't tell you how many people have been contacting us to say, what is the status? Are we still going forward? Because there is the expectation that there was COVID and that uh, traffic traffic in an airport, all traffic in airports all around the world had been reduced. I think this morning in the presentation from Ayata that I was just talking about to Barry, we heard that Heathrow International, the leading airport in the world, has seen about 15 to 20% of its normal traffic. And so you would have possibly the expectation that there would be a loss of interest, but absolutely not. Barbados remains a marquee destination. And I think it's important for us to always remember to be proud of what we have and what is a part of us and what, how people see us. And so there were 13 bidders originally as at October last year. Every last one of them remain interested and engaged. We didn't necessarily pause the transaction. What we started to do was to make sure that we restructured the transaction given the revisions that needed to be made to our forecasting modeling. And so what we have done since then in collaboration with the IFC is we have looked at what the restructured agreement could look like. We've made a number of changes that need to be finalized. And we're hoping that within another couple of days or so, once we've gotten past where we are now, the truth of the matter is when the COVID itself, the various lockdowns followed by Volcano really got in the way of our ability to focus our attention in full on finalizing the mechanics of that. But now we've actually gotten the airport open. We're gonna give it full steam ahead and full, full, full attention so that we can get this very important transaction finalized. And we, we of course give the commitment that it will be done transparently and that there will be a sharing of full information with the public of Barbados via you, the media. Um, I have a question, sorry, Marcia Giddens, Barbados Advocate, a question for Minister Bostick. Now that there has been a pause in the ash fall, will there be any air quality studies done for, to be done for the country? Or if there have started, um, can you give us an update on what has been found? Right, um, the answer is yes, but the department that is responsible for this is actually the Environmental Protection Department, which falls under the Ministry of the Environment and National Beautification. Of course, we do collaborate, but we, 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 they have been doing some work and I'm sure that they will be in a position shortly to say exactly what is happening in that regard. Are there any further questions at this time? Um, well, another one to Minister, yes. one to Minister yes. Abram, just a oh, quick sorry. one. In terms of the ash that has been collected in bikes, um, if it's SSA or otherwise, will there be any trucks be going around to the communities to collect this and when will that start? Um, yes, definitely trucks are going to be moving around to collect the ash. We've identified the sites where we're going to deposit it, but as you can well understand, the priority ash in bikes is not blown anywhere. So the priority right now is to remove the loose ash, get the roadways clean, get communities clean, get the government installations clean, and um, arrangements will be made in the coming week to collect the ash that has been um, collected by householders. But frankly, if it is in bags right now, then it is not the priority for us. The priority is to get the loose ash off the road and out of the air. Barry, you had a question? Yes, a, my final question is to Minister Airbones as well. Uh, Minister, the Prime Minister would have said there are about 1,600 of kilometers of road uh, you have to try to clean. Uh, can you give us an idea of how much you were able to clean within the last 40 hours uh, out of that 1,600 kilometers of roads? Barry, um, thank you for the question. I, the priority and the concentration has been on the major named and numbered highways, so the ABC Highway and uh, Highways 1 to 7. Persons are being deployed as well to clean up some of the minor roads. Um, the bulk of the highways have been addressed. 
as you can see, if you drive on the highway, they've been out in full force over the last couple of days. That came, that was paused yesterday as we took everybody off the highways and onto the airport runway. So that will resume as well. It's, a, it's a, effectively a 24 seven operation. I will get an assessment from the Minister of Public Works and try to give you a percentage completion by tomorrow. But I can't give you a percentage completion at this point in time, but just know that every single resource available to the government of Barbados is currently deployed to clean up the country. Okay, I have one. Yeah. Oh. All right, go ahead, question. go ahead. had a question? Yeah, I have a question for um, Mr. Lorenz. Could you give me an update um, on the GIS Pro? If I can give you an update on the GIS? Probe, the probe that's, that's there and then the GIS. Randy, I will address that at some point in time next week. Um, I would prefer if we keep this one focused. We, we operate some time constraints now um, with persons having to get back to doing things, uh, in particular Minister Cummings and myself. I undertake to update you fully in respect of what is going on with GIS. I would like the opportunity as well to just speak with the new chairperson, speak with the board to see exactly where they are. And, and if anything, just have a, a meeting with the press and the board itself and let you address your questions directly to them. Um, we have nothing to hide. I'm happy to answer your questions, but I can't do it right now in this press conference. Wendy, I believe you had a question. Yes, um, this one is for Mr. Abrams as well. It was mentioned that um, while Minister Dugid is in charge of the exercise dealing with the government buildings and the cleaning, can you give any indication as to if any of the key agencies are going to be offline during these cleaning exercises? Say, for example, BRA, Licensing Authority, what have you, because um, there would have been some downtime. We would have seen some complaints online, a couple calls about it. Can you indicate to me now if any critical services are going to be offline for the cleanings? I can't at this point in time, as I understand it, the difficulty we had was in customer facing services. So services that required customer interaction because of the inability to operate the offices as much work as can be done remotely has been done remotely. I do not understand that there has been any interruption of the remote aspect of it, but I can check that out for you and get back to you on that one happily. As you can appreciate, the difficulty with this press conference is that we're trying to focus on certain things in the press conference. So the ministers who are responsible or who can accurately or easily answer these questions might not be here at this point in time, but I can assure you that we will, I will get that information to you from you, Wendy, and I will share that information with you before the end of the day. Okay, well, I think that's a good point on which we can end if members of the media are satisfied. So as we close, let me thank the Minister of Health and Wellness, Lieutenant Colonel, the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick, the Minister of Home Affairs, Information and Public Affairs, the Honorable Wilfred Abrams, Minister of Tourism and International Transport, Senator, the Honorable Lisa Cummins, the Senior Veterinary Officer, Dr. Mark Trotman, and Director of the UWI Seismic Research Center, Dr. Erosila Joseph. Members of the media, thank you for your questions and the public wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you.